great to be back here. Uh, many thanks to Jane and DCU for inviting me here to speak again. To, today I plan to touch on a number of themes related to media and broadcasting uh, in Ireland, after which, as we've heard, I'm happy to take some questions. I'm also going to talk again about broadcasting policy in Ireland. It's a subject I've spoken about at every available opportunity for the last five years in an effort to get some engagement and push through some change. I still live in hope. Uh, I'm not going to map out a future for RTE. That is the role of the new Director General and it's a challenge that I'm sure D Forbes will relish. I did that in a speech here in DCU five years ago. I set out my thoughts on what RTE's role should be in the digital age and how RTE needed to evolve and change to meet the challenges and public expectations at that time. There is therefore a certain symmetry in that I am here today just a few weeks away from finishing in RTE. I must say that up until quite recently I haven't thought too much about my leaving. Uh, my wife has every minute of every day but uh, I haven't. General elections and 1916 commemorations leave little time for anything else. But in the last couple of weeks, I have begun to reflect on what has been an incredibly busy and challenging period for RTE and what a huge privilege it has been for me to lead the organisation over the last five years. Deep and long recessions are tough on almost everyone. They're <coughs> incredibly tough on people. They're tough on organisations providing public, ser public services. They're tough on businesses. And even, dare I say it, they're tough on politicians. Now that Ireland is emerging from this very difficult period, many are scarred, tired and angry. Public debate and discussion has hardened and become more polarised, not just here in Ireland, but right across Europe and beyond. In this environment, a broader spectrum of views gain new traction among those who are disillusioned with the institutions and political parties they hold responsible for the stresses and hardships of their own lives. Leading RTE through all of this has been and continues to be challenging. Maintaining fairness and respecting and giving space to a whole new political diversity requires constant attention. I have been closely involved in or led RTE's election coverage for 20 years, but I can't remember a campaign as complicated and tricky to navigate as the one we've just had. That is our job and I hope RTE has done it well, but times of political and societal stress inevitably lead to more friction with all sides, including whoever is in government. It is a difficult climate for policy change, unless that policy change is driven independently. And this is a theme I'll return to later. RTE itself has also had, also had to manage and adjust to sudden and substantial falls in its own resources. Job losses, pay cuts and widespread cutbacks have been a dominant feature in RTE, as they have been in many businesses and organisations throughout the country. In parallel to all of this, of course, the media itself is undergoing a period of profound change. The digital age has brought enormous opportunities for RTE and for media and journalism generally, but technology and changing media habits are also challenging and at times undermining long established business models and norms. Quality, breadth and depth all cost money. Money that media organisations are increasingly finding it difficult to generate. Facebook and Twitter are fantastic organisations. They are great for distributing news and media content, but they have no interest in frontline reporting, in backing up stories, in maintaining balance and fairness, in offering divergent perspectives or engaging in any real editorial oversight. What those organisations don't do is precisely what RTE and others engaged in quality journalism do. For my part, I will miss those special days when our reporting or programming caught the public attention, challenged the consensus or bore witness to extraordinary events. It was and is on those days that RTE is doing its job <coughs> and telling Ireland's story. Sometimes it's been difficult and upsetting stories, such as the investigation we undertook in the Iris Attractor facility in Mayo. Other times it has been stories central to our democracy and way of life, such as an election or a referendum. 
And in other days, it was stories that brought us all together, sporting occasions, national events such as the 1916 commemorations, the Late Late Toy Show, a significant radio interview, or a finale of Operation Transformation. I will also miss wrestling with the strategic challenges facing RTE and, in, and indeed many other Irish media organisations. I've worked in RTE as a journalist, producer, editor, manager and director general. During this time, I have watched and done my best to meet the huge and varied challenges facing media and journalism here in Ireland and beyond. That RTE has evolved its offering, developed new services and continues to retain the trust of the public, despite getting many things wrong, amid all the changes in media, technology and society over that period, is a testament to the talent, commitment and creativity of everyone in RTE and all those in the independent production sector and beyond. It is also a testament to the enduring value in the eyes of the public of public service media. Public service values and principles matter and they underpin RTE's future and its ongoing legitimacy. The very significant public funding that RTE receives each year comes with real responsibilities. And while those responsibilities have been laid down in statute for over 50 year, years, the context in which they must now be met has changed beyond all recognition. Now, the internet makes it easy to find information, but much harder to know if you can trust it. It's easy to find people and media outlets that you agree with, and easy to avoid those that you don't. It's easy to find small communities of interest, <coughs> but much harder to reach the country as a whole at any one time. The, inform age has been, the information age has been great for those that can afford and access broadband, but those that can't on the margins of society risk being left behind. In a world increasingly dominated by international media and content, how are we in Ireland going to support and per preserve vibrant local culture and distinctive local identity? At its best, I believe that quality public service media offers a compelling response to these challenges. And while, of course, RT will have to continue to change, enhance and refresh its offering over the coming years, I am very confident that it has the capability, ambition and legitimacy to remain essential to Irish daily life. I also believe this is very much in Ireland's interest. So where does RT stand now? And how strong is public service media in Ireland? Let's start with the good news before we get to the bad. Much has been achieved. In short, in summary, staff and man in, in radio, staff and management have radically changed the schedules of a reinvigorated RT Radio 1. If its resurgence continues, Radio 1 will very soon have a 25% share nationally and a 33% share in Dublin which would be a significant achievement for those staff and management and those independent producers who supply the programming. Radio are also successfully refocusing 2FM on a younger audience. Our digital offerings have also been radically reshaped. New ventures like GAA Go are proving successful and a new iteration, and a very important new iteration of RTE.ie and the RTE Player are due out later this year. The launch of Serview Connect in a few months is another on of, uh, innovation that we all feel offers huge potential for RTE. The introduction of a digital newsroom has ensured that RTE News app is the most downloaded in the, in the country. The main 6 1 <coughs> and 9 o'clock news television bulletins remain at the heart of our schedule and, more importantly, at the heart of Irish lives, as indeed does Morning Ireland and other programmes in radio. We have seen the importance of our digital service, particularly during the last election. RT Current Affairs is back producing top quality programming after some challenging and difficult years. RT has refocused its television services around a new channel strategy and has added RT Junior, Ireland's only channel just for kids, successfully to its suite. We saw this new channel strategy at its best during the 1916 commemoration. The range and depth of 1916 related programming commissioned and produced was really special. Our overall 1916 coverage demonstrated an organisation that I believe has refound its confidence, much shaken in recent years. 
We will also have, have a new Irish, action, uh, Irish language action plan and we will be announcing a new diversity strategy and report which hopefully will go some way towards addressing the gaps we have in this critical area. The bad news is that while our financial situation has stabilised, substan substantial challenges remain. I'd love to be standing up here telling you that all of Orte's funding challenges are over and we can all just look ahead and concentrate on programming. Until our funding model is changed, that will not be the case. Independent consultants appointed by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland have recognised the strides we've taken in recent years, the efficiencies, the reductions in costs, the, uh, the service we provide. But without change at policy level, those services may face further reductions and restructurings in the immediate years. The other storm cloud for all content producers in Ireland is that audience fragmentation shows no sign of abating. Our experience in the first three months of this year shows some of the dilemmas we and others face when confronted with a mobile digital audience. Our television audiences, and I'll share some of the research that we've done on this, our television audiences <coughs> are now watching different types of programming in dramatically different ways. Live viewing <coughs> remains dominant for most programming at about 90%. And that's a very important point to make. The vast majority of people still which watch television in a linear fashion. But if you look at a program from the recent series of Homeland, for example, of the total audience, only 46% watched it live as scheduled on RT2. Over 50% of the audi audience chose to watch that program over the course of a week using their PVR, the player, or multiple devices. Fair City, Ireland's most popular soap has also experienced real changes in viewing patterns over the last 10 years. The overall viewing has actually risen slightly during that time, which is quite an astonishing uh, statistic. 10 years ago, 452,000 people watched it live. 76,000 watched the repeat. Last year, 367,000 people watched Fair City Live, with 168,000 watching it later. The non-live audience has doubled. Recent research we conducted on audience interaction with our general election coverage was fascinating. When asked how they followed the counter re results, a whopping 79% of those surveys said they followed it on television. The figure was down only marginally on the 2011 figure, and which absolutely questions the view that traditional linear television in the, sh in the short term is a sunset medium. But of those surveyed, 34% said they, they followed coverage online, and 15% said they followed it on mobile. The mobile figure has nearly trebled, and some of the increases in our mobile traffic in the last 24 months are way beyond that in terms of increases in usage in some areas. So our audience are still watching mainstream television coverage in very large numbers, but they're also accessing an, a lot of other mediums as well uh, to get their news. Yet the conundrum for us all, all of us media providers, is that commercial income from digital remains a fraction of our overall commercial income. That income is getting more complicated, and I'll just give one example, current example of this. While it's early days, it is worth noting that in Ireland generally, it would seem that video on, income from video on demand has fallen in the first three months of this year, compared to a rise in television advertising spend. The proliferation of channels has driven television prices down to such a level that they may now be hitting digital revenues. That's how complicated the market has become. And navigating it is even trickier than even last year. I do firmly believe, though, that it is possible to still navigate through this maze and to take, because we can't just see the negatives and the challenges, to take the hugely positive opportunities that it gives media organisations like RTE and others in delivering our contents across multiple platforms. I could have written the whole speech about this area, as I, f I still find it completely fascinating, but there are other themes I want to touch on, but I am happy to take questions on all of that later. 
The themes I want to touch on are about persistent and structural problems facing the whole sector, not just RTE, and ones that the sector cannot solve on its own. Firstly, the regulatory system governing public service broadcasting in Ireland is broken. While the 20, 2009 Broadcasting Act established the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland and a complete system of regulation and review, the BAI's recommendations have been consistently ignored. Every year, RTE publishes a set of commitments on output and other areas. These are assessed for the BAI by independent consultants and recommendations are made on public funding as a result. This process is legally outlined in the Broadcasting Act. The BAI have made three consecutive recommendations to increase public funding to RTE and furthermore stated in the annual review of 2014 that the level of public funding was inadequate for RTE to meet its objectives. <coughs> These were ignored and public funding was cut by 15 million since 2010. This is not the BAI's fault. It is doing its job. But either the BAI has to be listened to or the legislation has to be changed. Anything else makes the process invalid. That is now the reality. Key policy decisions, key policy decision making in broadcasting needs an independent view. It is a different type of industry. It is very difficult to see how a public media organisation like RTE doing its job in an election campaign is not going to ruffle some political feathers. How then is it that the same organisation is going to then try and persuade the same body politic that it needs broadcasting changes. It's just not going to happen. RTE is about to head into a new <coughs> five-year planning cycle without any meaningful response to the first one. The whole process is now increasingly lacking in credibility or substantive purpose. RTE is not seeking to increase the burden on individual households, but rather reform of the licence fee, which is no longer fit for purpose or reflective of the consumption of public service media and programming and content, as the figures I've just quoted show. Evasion alone results in over 40 million in lost funding for public service media every year. RTE is also not looking for a free ride. We fully accept the added responsibilities that such funding would bring. I have suggested over the years that in return we would re-examine our commercial footprint, that we would share more of our content, that we would spend a minimum of 50% of any additional income in the independent production sector, that we would accept new output targets, new commitments on content, and new targets on types of content provision. Still nothing has changed. Now I say, let's engage the entire content production industry, including local commercial radio, to try to find a joint way forward. Similarly, the current situation in law that exempts satellite and cable providers such as Sky and UPC from paying fair compensation to Irish broadcasters is simply unacceptable. Across a number of countries now, such retransmission fees comprise a significant commercial income stream for broadcasters at a time when advertising revenue is increasingly under threat, much of which is, ironically, being introduced by the same satellite and cable providers. A rebalancing of the legislation to enable negotiation of a fair value for their content and channels could be of significant help to, our, to all broadcasters, not just RTE. Another growing storm for all content providers in Ireland is the fact that UK channels selling advertising are now taking close to 50 million euro out of the Irish market each year. That's over 20% of the market. These same channels, some 47 of them, invest little or nothing in Irish programming, Irish production companies, or in the cr creation of Irish jobs. Not only are they taking significant direct revenue out of the market, but by selling advertising at an enormous discount, they are also depressing the price of advertising here well below comparable UK rates. This is now affecting all Irish media organisations, including newspapers and commercial radio. 
Oh, we've, we've got our, someone trying to get in out there. <laughs> Is there a seat? All of these issues for the whole Irish content industry, not just, all of these issues, and th this is the important point, all of those issues are for the whole Irish content industry, not just for RTE. You know, uh, television rates going to the level that they are on some of these channels is impacting media way beyond television. And uh, it, it, it is an issue that we all need to face. Given the pressure that all domestic media organisations are under. I understand why the prevailing atmosphere between us is one of competition and threat, and we've been as guilty of, of that as anyone else. However, I am convinced that we have much in common, that we should work together to address these challenges. RT has been open to discussions on all these issues over the past few years. RT has had a number of meetings with the independent producers, uh, independent broadcasters of Ireland, with John Purcell and Tim Collins, to see could we agree a joint funding platform. That wasn't possible before the general election, but the fact that the meetings took place at all was a step forward, I believe, from all sides. There is potential here for an Irish content producer's approach, not just a narrow RTE organisational one. RTE has also developed a much better relationship with Screen Producers Ireland, and the chairs of both organisations have for the first time jointly pressed ministers for reform that will increase support for the sector. The reason I mention these areas is, is that RTE cannot fix or reform these on its own. But they do have a huge impact on ours and others' capacity to deliver on our remit and continue to invest in Irish programming, Irish journalism and the creative sector. With imagination, with political will, and broader and deeper cooperation, so much more can still be achieved. I believe the prize of a strong, vibrant and secure RTE and Irish content sector is worth it. Finally, I would like to finish by reading you part of a letter I received last uh, December. As you might imagine, I received many letters, but few as moving as this one. It is quite long, so I won't read it all, and the person who wrote it has given permission for it to be quoted. Dear Director General, it is approximately one year now since prime time, the Primetime team screened the programme entitled Inside Bungalow 3. My sister, Mary Garvin, was one of the people who featured in it. The reason I am writing to you now is to thank you and everybody in, or in the RTE team for their excellent, wonderful investigative journalism. The shocking scenes shown on that programme shocked and distressed my family and the entire nation. Some months following the screening of that program, my sister and five other residents uh, who shared Bungalow 3 with her moved to a newly refurbished bungalow called Shalon. It is lovely and she is very happy and content now. Her care and the general quality of her life has greatly improved. The contribution of the RTE team has forever changed for the better the care and well-being of people with intellectual disabilities all over the country. The Garvin family is forever in your debt. Thank you, and long may this wonderful work continue. <coughs> Sheila Garvin Ryan. Letters like that make us realise more than anything that what truly matters is the programmes we make and the stories we tell. It's easy to get blinded by the challenge of funding, technology and distribution. These are real and difficult, but are only relevant if audiences want to watch, listen and engage with what we produce or commission. I have always believed that. I have always felt that extra, every extra cent of commercial income we chased was about more money for content. Every time we pressed on public funding, it was about more money for content. Every time we had to cut costs, and this was the most difficult dilemma, it was about protecting the future of content provision in financially difficult times. RTE must and will continue to find and tell stories of consequence and relevance. Stories that touch and move people. Stories that demand a response. And stories that seek to enrich and to add to public debate and vitality in our culture. Because a society that makes the courageous and proper choice of funding public service media deserves to have that decision rewarded with the very best that that funding can provide. Thank you.